10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We are live at the Freedom Center this morning. That's right. Welcome. Let's take our places at our seats. I say we're live because we, streaming has started at exactly 1030. So we, we want to welcome you to the house of the Lord. Let's get ready. We're going we're gonna to go there today. So good to see everyone coming in and fellowshipping and blessing one another as the Lord has called us to do. We're waiting on Pastor to come up here to lead us in praise and worship this morning. Yeah, he, he's, he's making Bible connections. Thank God. If you were in Bible Connections, I know that you were blessed this morning. If you're not going to a Bible Connection, we invite you to attend them at 9.15 in the morning. They're in between the early and the second service. Also, if you're a Spanish speaker, we'd like to invite you this afternoon to at 5.30 for our Spanish ministry. El Centro de Libertad, which simply means the Freedom Center in Spanish. So we'd like to invite you to come join us this afternoon at 5.30. We know today is called the Super Day, Super Sunday, or different many. There's a big football game I think going to be played tonight somewhere. It's in the cold. But we want it to be hot and warm here with us. We got brothers and sisters that are here, so let's get ready to worship. And I invite you to stand up as we take your places, as we get ready to welcome those that are still coming in. Let's just worship this morning. Let's give him all the praise. He is more than super to us. He is our all in all. His name is Jesus, and that's our Lord. He's our King. Thus we render him all the honor and all the glory. So if you're with me, let's just lift up our hands. Let's praise, let's praise, let's praise. Let's worship the Lord, and let's enjoy the day that he has made today.
through the valley of the shadow of death Your perfect love is casting out fear And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back, I know you are near And I will fear no
the last No one is greater than you No one is higher You never fail Always prevail We put our trust in you God of the brave
worship you, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, never need you back, never tongue confess the name of Jesus. say Jesus <laughs> Jesus there is just something about that name amen Jesus says that there's no other name given and in that name that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess Jesus is Lord amen Jesus is Lord Jesus is life and he's called us into a relationship with him Every one of you in this room, you are a child of God. If your confession is Jesus Christ is your Lord, his whole goal was to bring us to the Father through that blood that was poured out on the cross. Prayed over his disciples, John 17, Lord, that they would know you as I know you. That they would be one with you as you and I are one. Relationship. I pray today that you do not leave this place without being stirred to go deeper in your relationship because he wants to know you. Amen. He's done everything moving manward. <laughs> it's us that need to make a move Godward. Amen. Amen. So, Father, we, we invite you here. We invite Holy Spirit that you would just open our ears, open our hearts. And you would do what you need to do in us and that there'd be truth here. There'd be equipping here. There would be an impartation of you in us. And Lord, that we would walk out of this place less of us and more of you in whatever area of our lives that that needs to be. And Lord, even if it's just resetting our worldview, resetting our faith view, resetting our love view, everything, Lord, pertaining to life and godliness. And Lord, that you are the life, the truth, and the way. We worship a living, risen Savior. And Lord, that you are about eternal life in all of us. And Lord, that we would just be reset to those things today before we walk out of this room. You'll do what you need to do. I pray if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, they don't leave this place without settling that one today. Amen. It's not complicated. And uh, he loves you. Amen. Amen. Why don't you be seated? I don't know if we've ever done it uh, two back to back, but we're going to. Baby dedications, amen. We've got baby Angelica, uh, this parents Abraham and uh, Jalisa uh, Yuba. Were y'all here?
Y'all come on up. There they are. Maya and Abigail coming with them. This is a, a this is a beautiful moment, really, and um, to participate in what God already purposed and planned for them a long time ago. <laughs> So who, who all is here with me? Um, that's uh, Salisa, and that, that is uh, Angelica's uh, grandmother. Okay. Uh, that's uh, Curly. That's Curly. Oh, she's sitting over there. Okay. okay. So that's a great aunt. And that's Mr. and Mrs. Price. They are friends of the family. Um, and this is... Uh, that's, uh, am I missing anybody? Okay. <laughs> that is uh, uh, Granny, Granny Rusell. And this is my wife. Yes, and we're praying over Angelica. Amen. Yes, and um, you know there there was in our notes today in the sermon it was out of uh, Jeremiah one five. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you and have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Beautiful passage that God was speaking to Jeremiah that before he was even tissue, <laughs> even before conception that he was already in God's mind, already had callings, plans, giftings laid out for him. And this is true for all of us. And now I believe more so than anything, that's what we do when we come together and dedicating a life, a child, because the Lord had, has great plans for Angelica. And we just want to recognize it. For us, it's really awareness, <laughs> Lord, that you would make us aware of all these things that you've imparted into her. So let's pray. Father, we... We uh, come in agreement today, Father, and just dedicating and, and uh, praying over this sweet, sweet, precious little life, Lord God, that, Lord, that was in your mind a long, long time ago, even before, Lord, she was formed. Lord, uh, you, she was in your heart. And, Lord, that you have plans for her. And as the Lord even spoke to Jeremiah later, to prosper us and for success and not to fail, but that you are for us and not against us. And the Lord, that you've put your very presence in us. That's how far you have moved manward, that you've put yourself in us. And so we thank you for that. And we just pray over sweet little Angelica, Lord God, that you would ordain her steps as you have already, Lord, that she'll see clearly light unto her path with each step that she takes. And for mom and dad to see those things and to, and to be able to steer her and to lead her and direct her in the path that she's to go and that she'll never turn from it but Lord that she'll be equipped Lord to walk in that calling of her life and Lord you'll put a hedge of protection around her all the days of her life and Lord that she'll prosper and Lord that she will be successful in all the things that she puts her hands to Father and Lord in everything you know your word says that in all labor there's profit and Lord you want to see profit in our lives as we lay our hands to those things you've called us to so we speak that over her Lord that she'll have a heart for you a love for you a love for your word a love for your presence Lord God and Lord that it'll be sweet for her in all the days of her life Lord we, we speak that over her and us precious family Lord God in nurturing that and stewarding that in Jesus precious name Amen Amen Bless y'all. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we, we have another one. We got a, just a kind of a rolling line here. <laughs> uh, this is Tyler and Renee. Nap, where y'all at? Oh, there they go. Yeah. Bring in their, their other children, Alicia, Emmanuel, Danielle, and Abigail. Tyler and Renee. This, this is a Levi. It's Levi. And Levi was born a little early, right? Yeah. A little bit, 10 days early. All right. He was in a hurry to get here. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, Father, we speak over Levi right now, Father, and just laying hands on him and 
Lord, just seeing him right now in peace right now, Father. That peace, your peace, to be on him all the days of his life, Father God. And Father, I thank you, Father, that he will grow up to be a mighty man for you, that loving you with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his might, just as his mom and dad love you with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their might. You'll impart that into him, Father. And Lord, he'll be grounded in your word, have a passion for your word. And Lord, that you have gifted him, Lord, just, just as we prayed for Angelica, Lord, that you, you knew uh, Levi long before he was even conceived. You, you knew him and you had plans for him. And Lord God, that you will bring forth those callings in his life and giftings in his life. And Lord, that he will be a success for your kingdom. Not success in terms of what man thinks, but kingdom success in all the things that he lays his hand to. Fruit that will come forth from his hands. And Lord, uh, profit for your kingdom. And Lord, in having a heart for you and a passion for your word. And ears that hear. And a spirit that senses yours, Lord God. Knowing your voice. Lord, these are the things we pray for our children. Lord, that they would know you. And they would know you, Father, with all their heart and have passion for you. So we speak that over him, Father. And knowing that, Father, you have a calling upon his life. And Lord, I pray for Renee and for Tyler to be able to discern that, to see that. And to be able to put things in front of him. To help him grow, nurture those things within him. And Lord, he won't depart from those things. And we know that to be true. And we thank you for that. And so, Father, just... Bless him in all the days of his life and protect him all the days of his life. Father, put a hedge of protection around him. And Lord, let him grow up to be mighty for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. I think it's it's so awesome seeing you know babies dedicated it's just awesome as as I mean I'm pretty sure most of us are parents in here being committed to raising our kids in a godly manner and the knowledge of Jesus Christ and it's such a huge responsibility and uh, like every night when I put my ki kids to sleep I always pray over them and not only do I pray for them I pray for you know, for myself, that God would give me the wisdom to show them what Jesus is like and to bring them to that knowledge. Uh, that's my prayer, that God would give us wisdom on how to raise them. And, and I pray that every night over them. You know, I, as parents, you know, it's, there, I never forget, there was that switch that happened when my firstborn came. Just something like switched inside of me and something changed. And... It's such a privilege that, you know, I get to be a dad. It's just an amazing thing. I love it. I really do. That's some sleepless nights that I get. But anyway, uh, if you didn't know where you're at this morning, you are at the Freedom Center Church. This is an awesome time to be. You could have been anywhere on a Sunday morning. Some of y'all could have still be in bed, but you're here this morning and you're ready to receive. Get ready for that. We believe in loving God, loving others, living intentionally, bringing God's kingdom down here to earth. We believe in salvation, deliverance, and healing. Those three things, that salvation is just the, get, it's just the doorway in to something much bigger than you realize. We believe in that God wants to make you whole. That's what we believe in, not just get you in the door, but make you whole. And for those of y'all who are streaming live, thank you for joining us. You're in for something real good, so stay tuned. Wherever you're at in the world, we're so glad that you could be with us. And if, I know we're somewhat of a large church family, but if you're with us for the very first or second time, would my first and second timers please stand? We just want to acknowledge you and give you a warm welcome to our church body this morning. If you're with us for the very first or second time, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being with us this morning. 
Uh, if you just remain standing for just one minute until our ushers give you this bag, uh, we have a little bag of information about our church. And in there, there's a little card that if you fill out with your information and bring back to our table where the big TV screen is at the back, at the end of service, we have a little something for you guys just to show our appreciation and that, you know, our excitement that you're here with us this morning. So our goal is, as a church family, to give you guys either a high five or a hug uh, before you get out of here. Amen? Amen. Okay. I think I'm going to tag team with Pastor Ruben. We have a baptism coming up. That's right. Welcome this morning. We get to go to the waters this morning. Uh, we have Brother Stephen Gregory Dozier. He's coming to be baptized this morning. We're excited about it. Take it in. It's always a joyous time. So the Lord told me that it was, he was ministering to me yesterday. He says, Reuben, it's time to rejoice and rejoice and rejoice. And this is definitely one of those times that for me is very special. When we symbolize, when we, one, it's an act of obedience to the commands of the Lord. One was to believe in him and accept him as our Lord and King. Second one was to be baptized and submerged in water as a symbolism to all of us as witnesses that we, that our brother has committed to say, my old life is dead. I'm about to come out a new man in the spirit of God. And that's, that's what we're going to do. So brother Stephen. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. But in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I will baptize you, my brother. Where's Noreen Brooks? Come here, Noreen. Noreen has a testimony she wants to share. The goodness of God, amen. How he looks out for us all the time. And the, the light over here. <laughs> Awesome. He's awesome. Amen. <laughs> Monday afternoon, Monday afternoon, I drove up to my home and I drove in a driveway. And instead of going straight into the garage through the house, I decided to get the garbage can and bring it in. So I did that, and that took about five to seven minutes, I guess. And when I came back to the truck, Dodge Ram 1500, we're not talking small. <laughs> truck was, threw itself in reverse and was leaving off the driveway. And your first impulse when you're dealing with something like that is to stop it couldn't stop that big truck. So I went, uh, I leaned in, and I heard a voice say, you're not going to stop that truck like that. And I actually couldn't. So as I was holding the steering wheel, and I thank God I did not fall, he allowed me to ease onto the ground. As I eased onto the ground, truck still going back ended up in a sitting, slightly reclining position. One foot, the left foot and leg, right in line with that first, uh, with that, that tire. Still holding on to the steering wheel on the ground. My other leg was in the uh, cab of the truck. And there I was on the ground put in the cab. And I heard the spirit say, hit the brakes. I said, now Lord, you're going to have to let me know exactly which one is the brake <laughs> and which one is the gas. Because you're in a sitting position, you're sitting on the ground. 
So he showed them exactly which one. So, of course, not having the strength in that position, I couldn't stop that truck. But it did slow it down. As I was sitting there on the ground, the Lord Spirit spoke to me step by step exactly what to do. So there I was listening to God and listening for him and thank God that he gave me the wherewithal to do what I needed to do in the name of Jesus. So as I was down there, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, not again, not this way, because this happened to me about six or eight years ago, that same truck. And I thought maybe I left it in park. No, I didn't leave it in park. But the Lord instructed me that Wednesday to look on the internet, and there is a recall on that truck. The dot, dot, and it slips out of gear. Dodge Ram 1500, 2001 through 2015. So if you got one, you might want to uh, check it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as, uh, and I want to tell you this. I don't want to take up too much time, but I want to tell you step by step how the Lord was dealing with me. So I'm sitting on the ground. And uh, I heard the Spirit say, ask me to send help. I said, Lord, would you send help? Would you send someone? And just as I said that, who appears but my husband? He wasn't scheduled to come home that time of day. But nevertheless, in the driveway, I'm on this side, and he parks to the left of me. Had he just drove in as usual. He couldn't see me on that ground, sitting in that big truck. I would have been crushed, perhaps dead. But God led him, and sometimes he does back in. But this particular day, he backed in, which means, you know, this truck is big. He has a 1500. This truck is big, so he blocked the whole street. You know if you're going to do a truck like that, you're almost in the neighbor, the people across the street, you're almost in their driveway. And he was able to see me on the ground. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, he jumped in the truck and stopped it. Now, I want to say there was so many, that was miracle number one. There were so many miracles connected to this. I got my shoe with me. You probably don't see my shoe. But had, and God took away all distractions because I had this shoe on. You know, when you're dealing with a car, when you ride up and down the road, you see empty shoes on the road. He didn't let me lose my shoe. Had I lost my shoe, I would have been distracted, and the shoe is all cut up. All the leather is messed up. That would have been my heel. The other thing is, and I, I, I know the testimony, I lived it, but there's some highlights I don't want to, uh, I don't want you to miss. <sighs> like I say, the Spirit told me to check, check for uh, recalls. There it was, and the national whoever of vehicle, safety vehicles, they said, uh, even though my VIN number wasn't listed, they're going to go back to that, to Chrysler and have them look that over. That should have been listed. The fir like the first time, I thought maybe, you know, you just naturally think you didn't put it in park. But apparently, I put it in park both times. Uh, during this whole ordeal, the Holy Spirit kept me conscious cognizant and without fear. I mean, I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening. And I thank God for his mercy. He speaks, but we need his grace and his mercy to hear it. We need all his grace to obey it. Uh, hmm. That, uh, I know there's something else on here. I got the paper. Uh, 
we're thankful that God looks out for you. Amen. For a reason. Amen. Thank you, Lord. He reminded me of what uh, Jack Taylor said. You got a pulse. You got a purpose. You're here for a reason. Amen. And uh, so thankful the Lord took care of you. Amen. Thank you, Marie. Aaron. Uh, can I have the ushers come up? We're getting ready to take up tithes and offerings. God loves a joy, a joyful. I was about, yeah. <laughs> God loves a joyful giver. There we go. And it's your choice. That's what I was trying to get out of my mouth. And really, when you, whenever you guys give tithes and offerings, that money is put to good use here at the church. It pays a, a lot for what we do here at the Freedom Center and a lot of the outreaches in the communities and the missions work that the church supports. Uh, a lot of your giving, pretty much all that money goes into that. So whenever you give, you can know for sure that you're given to a good cause. And God loves a joyful giver. And he always, he always somehow finds a way to bless you back for giving. To bless you back. I'll never forget. Uh, I, for some reason, I have a lot of stories as a college student. But I remember sitting in, sitting in church and uh, 20 bucks in my pocket. And I'm going, okay, I can get a lunch. And then i got to save up that 10 bucks for something else. Uh, and I remember this, the offering bucket was coming past. And I was going, yeah, God, I, I serve you enough. You know, I don't need to give. So, yeah, I'm pretty good. I'll never forget. As soon as that bucket came in front of me, uh, it, I heard it so clearly say, hey, Aaron, put your money where your mouth is. I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know, if I believe that God blesses me and that it's not up to my circumstances for him to bless me, then I can give what he has already given me in essence. And so I put that, that 20 bucks in the offering bucket and God provided for me. God provided for me. And uh, I know that he does the same way. I know we try to see things in the physical, but God doesn't see the physical. He sees the spiritual. He sees inside past all of that. So if you have your offerings, please raise it up. We're going to go ahead and bless it. Lord God, I thank you for everyone here. And as we give our tithes and our offerings to you, Lord God, uh, I just ask that you would bless that you would bless and that your favor would come down upon us, Lord God. We thank you. We thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. I'm glad to see all of your beautiful smiling faces here. It is February already. Can you believe it? We are in our second month of 2018. Where is the time going? It's going so fast. So let's jump into the announcements. Like I said last week, we are having a new series coming up called Love and Respect. It's going to be a married series led by Doug and Elizabeth Pitcher, and it's going to start this Wednesday at 7 o'clock, so you don't want to miss it. It's going to be in our Bible Connection classroom number one, and you want to see all you married couples there. So for more information, stay tuned. I'm going to play a little video for you, so lend me your ears. Hello, everybody. How are you all doing? Hi. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. New 2018. Year. Yes. We are so excited. We get to start teaching Love and yes. Respect yes. by Emerson yes. Egricks. This is going to be a five-week series on Wednesday nights. So it starts February 7th, ends March the 7th. We're excited about it because we actually read Love and Respect when we were dating. Yep. And it really did open our eyes to a lot of things, not even in our own relationship, but also we could see in other relationships, unfortunately, the lack of love toward women and the lack of respect exactly. toward men. Yep. You may be thinking, I don't get it, I don't understand it. And that is exactly why you need to come be with us February 7th to March 7th. Now, I did my homework first because I thought it was important to ask Doug, honey, what makes you feel really loved? R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Find out what it means to me. Yes, he did go there. Okay, he Something did. Like, like Aretha, right? Yeah, he went to. there. So um, that is something that's important to him as a man. Extremely important to him exactly. to feel loved. That's right. So I want to ask you, what is important to you to feel loved? Oh, um, all I need is love. Da, 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 da. 
See, that's it. All I need is love. Wow. All he needs that's is it. respect. That's right. But we got to figure out how to make that happen, mm -hmm. right? So we're asking you to trust us to walk through this five-week course with you. Join us Wednesday nights, February 7th to yep. March 7th. And we know God has something special for us because, you know, our pastor's heart is for our marriages to be strong. And you know why we're supposed to have a strong marriage? Because a strong marriage gives a strong family unit. And the best gift that we will ever give our children are godly marriages, learning how to have conflict right, learning how to show respect and love. So join us February 7th to March 7th for love and respect. Look at our shirts. I respect my husband. I love my wife. And this is really true. And so is that, right? That's right. All right, we'll Signing see you later. Up. Bye bye. Bye. This Friday coming up, we are having our sweetheart banquet for all my married couples, my engaged couples, and my dating couples. This is going to be the best date night for you. Just before Valentine's Day, so you can have two Valentine's Day, if you know what I mean. You guys can come here and be entertained. We're going to be having food. We're going to wine and dine you. It's going to be an awesome night for you and your sweetheart. So also, if you have kids, don't worry. We can take care of them. It's not a problem. We want you guys to come here and have fun. So that being said, if you want to come, we need you guys to sign up so we have enough food so that we can have the right number of seats out so we can take care of your kids, all of that stuff. So get up right now if you haven't signed up. I'm sorry, just kidding. You can sit down. But don't forget, after service, please sign up so that we can have all the stuff ready for you this Friday at 6.30. We can't wait to see you there. And our last but not least, we are having our Spanish service tonight at 5.30. So if you speak Spanish or if you know someone that speaks Spanish and loves Jesus, we want to see them here on Noche, which I think means tonight. <laughs> We on? Okay, great. Uh, sorry to hack the feed, guys, but I have an important announcement to make. Our Disciple Now weekend is coming up March 2nd through the 4th. That's a weekend retreat that we do here at the church. It's in-house and uh, where we get your middle schoolers and your high schoolers, and we spend the entire weekend with them. They're going to be spending the night at different host families, uh, fam trusted families from the church, and it'll be guys with guys, girls with girls, and uh, we're going to be pouring into them the deeper things of God and really getting them to put into practice the things that we've been teaching them on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. Uh, we'll kick off Friday night, that's March 2nd, with an awesome service. And then for Saturday, we're going to be doing our community outreach. I still don't have all the details on that, but it'll be good. Uh, one time we did some street witnessing in town center, and the other time we did a homeless outreach uh, over in downtown. It was amazing. So I'm still working out the details what we're going to do. Uh, but if you've never been a part of it, I encourage you to get your kids to sign up for this. Again, that's going to be March 2nd through the 4th. The cost is $25, but that includes food, includes fun, fellowship, and also a t-shirt, uh, their Disciple Now t-shirt. So grab an application at the back at the end of service, get them signed up because after February 25th, instead of $25, it's going to be $30. You're not going to want, you're, you're going to want to avoid that fee. Uh, so to get your kids signed up as soon as you can. And, uh, I think that's about it. Again, it's March 2nd through the 4th, and uh, we're kicking off Friday night, that Friday night. So get your kids signed up, and uh, we're back to you, Brandy. So that's all the announcements I have for you today, church. I love you guys so much. Have a blessed week. sadness from wherever you've been come broken heart let rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come kneel earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal earth has no sorrow that heaven can
And all those who stray Come sit at the table Come taste the grace There's rest for the weary A rest that endures Earth has no sorrow That heaven can cure Sources confirmed Tuesday that local freethinker Jared Olson called into question the idea that God has ever done anything for him, all while inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide. Diane has more on the story. Jared Olson attends Edmonds Community College, where we caught up with him while he was speaking to a gathered crowd about the need for, or lack thereof, God. This whole idea of God is just holding us all back. Olsen said this as the membrane across his larynx vibrated to modulate the flow of air from his lungs, making his speech audible to the people listening. What's he done for you? What's he done for me? Nothing. As the people listened, their intricate air structures were instantly being transformed by the invisible sound waves into abstract thought in their brain's nervous tissue. Olsen went on to pursue this line of reasoning further, claiming that, and I quote, Mankind has science, medicine, and mathematics to thank for its continued existence, rather than an all-powerful creator for which there is absolutely no evidence." End quote. According to eyewitnesses, he made these claims as the surface his feet rested on continued to spin around the Earth's core without any input from him, all while the only known habitable planet on which he stood rocketed around the center of the galaxy in perfect formation at the unfathomable rate of 490,000 miles per hour. Brady. Thanks, Diane. We understand Olson plans to detail religion's negative influence on society at a meeting next week, which is being held in the annex adjacent to both a Christian homeless shelter and a Catholic hospital. <laughs> That's mocking. A little tongue in cheek there. But true. Hello. Um, I'm calling today's message uh, The Force is With You. <laughs> I like the Star Wars movies. 
But they always say, may the force be with you. But here's the truth, guys. The force is with you because the force is the life of Jesus Christ. That is the force that is with you. And um, we, we've been going through uh, 1 John on Families on the Go. And by the way, just to make a plug there, if you're not involved in a life group during the week or a home group that we call it, um, I, just, I encourage you to come and hang out with us on Wednesdays. We've just started two weeks into going through the, uh, 1 John. And uh, we haven't got past the first four verses, so you're not late getting in there. So uh, anything else that we've done, you can go stream it. It's all there. Amen. But, um, and, and not to brag, but we got pretty good praise and worship, I'm going to tell you, for a Wednesday night. You don't want to miss it. And um, so we, we, we start uh, at uh, uh, 7 o'clock with 30 minutes of worship, 30 minutes of uh, Bible time, and then 30 minutes of just praying together. And we, we're in tables here, and it's just informal, and really create covenant groups of agreeing to prayer for things and seeing God move, and it's awesome. So I just encourage you to do that. And a lot of times what has been happening is some of the things we do in Families on the Go has been spilling over into everything that we do. And um, we taught this lesson two weeks back, and, and when it got through, really towards the end of it, I, I knew the Lord was wanting us to do this for the whole church body. And I told the group, I said, please don't get upset or bored if I wind up, or, or skip out. If I, if I wind up teaching this again, and I have embellished it a little bit from that Wednesday night, but I just felt like this was a message that, that you as parents need to hear, grandparents need to hear, but particularly for our young people. There is an assault on faith, and you're going to see that on a video that we're going to watch here in a little bit, that uh, it's, there's, it's, it's like being cool to call yourself an atheist, right? And you, here you are trying to raise your kid in the admonition of the Lord, and and, um, and then they go off to college and some, some professor starts putting some wild ideals in their head. And they, on the internet, they get a lot of little, little bullet points and little, that they can share regarding why they don't believe in God. And they, but you know, you're going to see on a video how shallow it is because the truth is there's really not any such thing as an atheist. What you're going to find, bottom line, is, is everybody's searching for something. And, and we'll see some of those things as we walk through this. And what's began to compel this, what I can't get past it for over a month and a half, is the first verse in 1 John. The first verse is just so powerful. And let's read 1 John 1 through 4, and then we'll walk through these things. But it said, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested. Now that, that right there is just been in my spirit. The word of life. This isn't just, you know, ink on paper. This is the word of life. When we start speaking the word, we're speaking life into one another. And I see evidence of it. My eyes have seen this. The words of life. I've experienced this. So he says, what we have seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. And what John is saying here in these first four verses, he says, I've experienced him. I have seen him. I've experienced him in incredible ways, and I've seen him, and I've seen his power, and I've seen his miracles, and I've known him. I mean, think of this. John, John w walked with Jesus for three and a half years of his life. He's experienced him. As a matter of fact, as we look at this, you know, John starts his journey with Jesus probably at the age of 16. At the point where he's writing this epistle, he's probably between 80 and 85 years old. He has walked with Jesus for about 60 years of his life. Three and a half years of those, literally every day with Jesus, experiencing relationship with him. And then after he was crucified and he saw him as a resurrected king of kings and lord of lords, he even was there. With, he ascended to heaven, the right hand of the Father. And then he himself, along with the other disciples, going forth in his name and doing miracles in his name and experiencing the power of God. He knows what he's talking about. He's experienced him. And I'm praying today to provoke your thought because this, if, I, if I were to put this in context of reset, because we've been talking about a lot about reset, this, I want to reset your worldview. And I want to give you a little ammunition to help reset the worldview of others, right? 
And um, because there might be some here even today that you might have questions, some doubts, might have gone through a faith crisis in your own life. And I'm hoping that when we get out here today, you're equipped and you're encouraged and you know that you know what you believe, right? That into this whole thing, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. See, I can tell you all the things that God has done in my life and incredible experiences I've had where his Holy Spirit wind blows past my flesh and the hair of my flesh stands on its end and Holy Ghost bumps all up down my body and experienced him and seen him do incredible things just like Noreen was talking about. Just Those are God things that can't be explained any other way. And you can sit there, you're going to have to either call me a liar or crazy. And, you know, there's some craziness to me. I admit that. But I ain't lying. Amen? I ain't lying. So, we're going to look at a lot of things this morning. We've got a lot to cram in here. And everything that we cram in here, we're going to look at some famous people's worldviews. People that we celebrate their talents. And we pay a lot of money to go see their movies and listen to their music. And I'm not doing this to demonize them or anything. They're just people. The difference is that they happen to be famous, so everything that they say is out there on the web. Everything I've said is not out there on the web, right? But the truth is, as we look at their worldviews, it's going to be similar to some of your own family members sharing the same kinds of worldviews. So when we come out of this, you're going to have a little bit of of resource and uh, be equipped a little bit to to counter some things in the way they think and and, and what their worldview is. But let's look at verse 1 again. What was from the beginning... What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. What was from the beginning implying that somewhere back in eternity past, we we have no ability to even fathom that logically. Because you look in Genesis and there's this incredible conversation where where there's there's more than one because it says, let us make man in our image. And you get this understanding that the Godhead is there, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there is this plural conversation taking place where, where it says, let us make man in our image. And then you see all of creation beginning to take place. And, and that's what John is referring to. What was from the beginning, Jesus Christ, concerning the word of life. And guys, Jesus is the word of life, right? He says, what we have looked at. And you can take yourself a journey through Scripture it's all through the Word. And even John says that he began it very similarly in the, in the Gospel of John as he does in 1 John, where in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? And you go through a journey. Here's Jesus. Jesus is the Word made flesh. We just came through Christmas, the Advent. That's, that's God moving manward, and he's coming to... to, to uh, uh, Reveal himself to man, the word made flesh. You go through to Revelations and you see this, this man riding on his horse and it says there's a name written on him and it says his name is the word. It's Jesus, Amen. the word, the life word. It's living, it's active, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And John is saying we've seen it and we've touched it. And those words are not light words. Those are really actually very heavy words, what he's saying there. Because as I said, you know, 60 years of his life poured out in following Jesus and experiencing Jesus, those three and a half years intensely of following Jesus every day. And he said, when it says we've looked upon, it means we have gazed intently. I've studied this. I've spent my life on this. And even the word touched could actually be translated grope, (laughs) groping. You know, if I said, hey, Somebody was groping your kid out there in the parking lot. You'd be riled up and go out there and do something about it, wouldn't you? Because that's a very powerful word. It tells us, that, and that's exactly what he's saying. If you look at Thomas, doubting Thomas, he said, stick your fingers in my wound here, in, in, this, in this where the spear pierced my side. Touch it. Stick your fingers in the nail prints of my hands. These are strong words that he says, we've touched it. We've seen it. We've laid our hands upon it. This is not some flippant thing. But Jesus, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, Jesus is the very force, the energy, and that determination drive behind life. That's Jesus. You can see the life of Jesus in a dear saint who's about to pass. You can see the spirit man inside of him overriding broken flesh. I've seen it with my own eyes many, many times. Jesus is that force. You know, it's interesting that even for atheists, that there's some kind of, you know, 
admission that, that there is a driving force behind life. I mean, just the very idea that, that something would drive life to come out of a putrid pool of nothing and then evolve and overcome all of the adaptations of life and it's going to adapt and the survival of the fittest, all of that's implying some kind of energy, some kind of force behind life that causes it to preserve itself. Even, even the atheist is admitting some kind of force or energy behind life. How about Jurassic Park? Anybody seen that one? We love those movies. I've seen them more times than I can count. And uh, uh, one, of the, one of the probably most quoted lines out of Jurassic Park is when they're in that laboratory for the first time seeing how they are breeding and, and cloning these dinosaurs. And, and that one uh, professor, he's got his, he's holding the dinosaur in his hands. And then after he's over the fascination, he realizes what's in his hands. He says, what breed is this? It's a raptor. How many of these do you have? And then all of a sudden, you, you hear the scientists confidently saying, oh, well, we, we, they can't reproduce, and we control them, and simply, you know, we deny them a certain enzyme and all this, you know. And, and then you've got Malcolm sitting there. He's the chaos theory scientist, right? Probably an atheist if you're, if you're putting every, all, your, all your ducks in a row uh, on chaos. <laughs> you know? And that's what he believes in that he's sitting there thinking in his mind, well, that's pretty arrogant for you to think that you can control all this with an enzyme, that you can engineer this. And then that one doctor is saying, well, it's scientific, it's logical. And he's saying, no, what does he say? Life will find a way. Life will find a way. Even out of an atheistic, evolutionary type mentality, here's an admittance that there's some force, some drive behind life. And it's all in your textbooks and science books that you go, your kids are reading in school and college, right? Went to college, paid for that huge biology book that they wouldn't buy back at the end of the semester, right? That ripoff that they do, right? Coming out with a new version. So I still have that book at home. And you open up on the first page, it talks about six or seven different ways that life might have happened on the earth. And the last one is evolution. It does include some intelligent life form, but the, but the teacher says, we won't be looking at any of those other things. What we will be concentrating on is evolution because it's scientific, logical, and we can study it and examine it and experiment with it, right? Well, there you go. But see, the problem is Jesus is life. And what atheists would say that nothing, you know, everything kind of came out of nothing. But guys, nothing has no drive. <laughs> nothing has no energy. <laughs> there is an energy and a force behind life, and it's Jesus, whether you know it or not. The force behind life is Jesus. And that's why even our words, when we speak the word, we're speaking life, and we're speaking life eternal. And we quote that verse a lot, especially as charismatics and charismatic church circles that, that, that uh, um, you know, that there's power of life and death in the tongue, right? And that power of life and death, it's not just that if you say negative things, negative things will happen, or if you say positive things, positive things will happen. That's actually a shallow thinking. The truth is the life that's in the tongue, you have the ability to speak eternal life. Because you have ability to speak the word and you have the ability to, like we talked about last Sunday, seeing the grace of God in the life of another person and speaking what God's doing in their life and connecting with that and agreeing with that and speaking eternal life into things. Amen? That's what it's about. Eternal life and that driving force behind that eternal life is Jesus. Jesus is life. Jesus is the word. And when we speak the word of God, we are speaking literally life. He who was from the beginning is the force of life eternal. And when we speak the word, we speak life eternal. Verse 2, he said, And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Jesus manifested that life when he came to earth as a man. Jesus was the embodiment of God in the earth. Jesus was all man, yet he was all God. Think of it this way. He was both and. <laughs> he was both and, not either or. He was both and. Does that make sense for you? He is Emmanuel, God with us. 
He is, this is Jesus. Jesus is God moving manward so that we have the capacity to move Godward back towards him. See, that's always the issue. It's never an issue of God moving man where he's done everything. For God so loved the world, he sent Jesus that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He's constantly been moving manward towards us. It's in the very beginning in the garden. Here's Adam sinning and he falls. And what does he do when he sins? He hides. He runs and hides. And then it says in the following verses that Jesus, I mean God, comes in the cool of the day and calls out, Adam, where are you? <laughs> where are you? And guess what? God is still calling out today. Where are you? Where are you? Because he's constantly moving manward. The problem is man moving Godward. Amen. See, that's the problem. I wrote a song a long time ago called Mighty Hunter. <laughs> Jesus is a mighty hunter. He's an excellent fisherman. He doesn't have any stories of the one that got away. He catches everything he snags, and he hauls it in. He's an excellent hunter. So Jesus' intentions in coming to the earth was to reveal the Father. Jesus introduces us to a relationship with the Father through the Son. You know, there's not a one specific verse I can take you to, to say that, you know, you, you need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's not a verse that literally says that, but it's implied all through the pages of the Bible. Everything is about having a relationship. Even that prayer of Jesus praying over his disciples, Lord, that they would know you and that you, they would be one with you just as we are one. And they'll have that same kind of relationship that we have. It's all about relationship. Verse 3 says, What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So here it is. All the experiences that we have with Jesus, just as all the experiences that John had with Jesus in seeing Him and experiencing Him and touching Him, all of these experiences had a result, a product, a relationship. And all of our experiences with God produce the same thing, relationship. It's all about relationship. Experiencing the life of the Word produces fellowship. It produces relationship. It's what it's all about. We're going to go through some quotes here in a minute of many famous people that you will know, you'll recognize. You've enjoyed their talents. You've enjoyed their work. And yet, you're going to hear them say some very uh, alarming statements where they don't believe in God and, or they're against religion. And a lot of them speak in terms of organized religion and blaming organized religion for all the messes in the world. And guess what? It's responsible for a lot of them. But what, what, it's not, what, what we're talking about is relationship, not religion. <laughs> they got the wrong R. It's, 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 it's relationship. And I want to be clear. As we share these quotes, I'm not doing this to make any of them look bad. They just happen to be famous people and their quotes are out there. And it represents worldviews that, that maybe some of you had one point in your life. Maybe some of your, your, your children or grandchildren or, or you might be here today struggling with some of these same ideas and questions. Well, guess what? We want to we help clear the air on some of these things for you today. But as we look at this, what, what I would say of each one of those people that we're going to look at Every one of them are created in the image of God. Hello. You're not created in the image of God just because you got born again and haven't go to church. Every person on the planet was created in the image of God. And for every person on the planet, that scripture that we shared out of Jeremiah is true for every person on the planet of the earth. Where, where the Lord said to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. <laughs> Before there was tissue, where the, where the atheist or, or the abortionist might say, it's not life, it's just a blob of tissue. Before you were even that, he says, I knew you. I gifted you. I commissioned you. I had a plan for your life before you were even conceived. So every one of you are created in the image of God. Every person you see out there with talent. See, we got to be careful. We empower the devil way too much. Because the devil has never deposited a talent in anybody. Because those things don't come from him. God's the one that gives talents. And those talents and abilities were inserted in you long before you were even tissue. Hello. What the devil does is perverts, distorts, distracts, 
comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He's not a, he's not a gifter. He's not a creator. He's a destroyer. That's all he knows how to do is tear stuff up. <laughs> so, every person that we talk about, and that's why we have to change our vision, how we look at people. Looking at them, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We want to see the life of God birthed into people. And you're not going to do that by being rude or ugly or getting mad, angry at them because they don't believe what you believe. There's still people created in the image of God. And you're going to find that a lot of this wrestling that they have with worldview and world philosophy is because of an inner turmoil they have because they are created in the image of God and they haven't found peace yet with who they are. That's why the Lord would say, I would that none should perish, that all would be saved. Because he knew all of them before they were even formed in their mother's womb. I mean, that's powerful stuff. It should change the way we think and the way we react and the way we treat people. All right. What should I do here? I will look at the fourth verse before we move it into the quotes. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. See, I want, I want these folks to get saved. Amen. I can't tell you how many times I watch a movie and I'm inspired by the talent of somebody and I just decide right there in that moment, I'm praying for them. I'm going to lift them up in prayer. Now, that might sound crazy to you, but it's not crazy to me whatsoever. I shared a story in the first service and this might, this might rock some of your sensibilities that your pastor would do such a thing, but you'll have to get over it. <clears throat> but I was here about 10 years ago putting a PA system together for the youth. They were fixing to go on a trip and they needed a portable PA system and I'm putting it all together. And it's about 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. I get a phone call from somebody who went to church here. And he said, hey, man, somebody just gave me some very expensive tickets, second row, for a Fleetwood Mac. You in? I'm there. Went home, got dressed. He picked me up. We went to the concert. And I'm standing literally as, as if my wife were Stevie Nicks, elevated on that stage. I'm about this far from her. Standing directly in front of her. And I'm enjoying the music. It was, it was a great concert. I'm so close. I can, I can see Lindsey Buckingham. All of his guitars are all custom made. They're kind of a hybrid between electric and acoustic, which I thought was awesome. And uh, I can see the chords he's making, whether he's using a pick or not using it. I can see every detail. And I'm about halfway into this concert, and I'm like, how did I get here? It just hit me. How did I get here? Because first of all, I would never buy those tickets. I'm too cheap. I'm not going to buy second row tickets for a Fleetwood Mac concert. Those were hundreds of dollars a piece, 200 plus probably. And, and I would never do that. If I'm going to buy tickets, I'm buying them by the sound guy because I figure he's mixing it for the room. It's going to sound better where he's standing than anywhere else. And it's more important that it sounds good that I'm sitting there close to him where they could even spit on me. <laughs> That's how close you were, you know. <laughs> but I'm standing here and it hits me. How did I get here? I did not wake up this morning fathoming that I would be standing here 20 feet or less from Stevie Nicks listening to her sing. And then I felt the Holy Spirit kind of tap me on the shoulder. And he said, you're here to pray. Hmm. Now that thought had not crossed my mind. It really hadn't. And all of a sudden I realized I was standing there for a purpose. This was not an accident. And then I thought, who was praying for her? Who in the earth is praying for her? And how many times has the Lord put us in a position where our reaction is to be critical of others rather than realizing, no, I'm here to pray. And so I just began to pray for her. And I have no idea the fruit of that, but all I know is that was my assignment. And I felt the Lord say, it's okay, you can enjoy the, the groove and you can enjoy the music, but your job here today is to pray. Pray. And that's, that's the heart of what I'm coming from with these quotes that we're about to look at. is to not to demonize anybody, but just to understand their heart and to pray for people. When you look at these quotes, most people react in two different ways many times when it comes to God. If they don't believe in God or if they label themselves as an atheist or an agnostic, one of their first things they're going to do is they kind of quickly create a wall that they don't have to interact with you by saying, well religion is the, pro is the root of the problem of all the problems in the mess in the earth. And so therefore, that's, they kind of exclude themselves from even talking to you about God because they associate that with religion when the fact is what they're missing is relationship. 
And then the next thing is they'll say, well, I don't believe that you can have a relationship with God because I don't believe there is a God because I don't see evidence in the earth. I don't see anything logical to tell me that there is an intelligent God out there that wants to have a relationship with me. So that's where many of them come from. The first one I wanted to look at is uh, uh, Bill Murray. Bill Murray is a funny guy. One of our movies we enjoy watching is What About Bob? Kind of a crazy movie. Taking baby steps, right, if anybody's ever seen it. And uh, Groundhog Day. I actually have a play that I had kind of sketched out to do, a Christmas play, Christian Christmas play, based upon that same concept of having to wake up every day until you get it right what Christmas Day is about. And, uh, um, but, but, but Bill Murray, he says, Religion is the worst enemy of mankind. No single war in the history of humanity has killed as many people as religion has. Now, I don't know if that's actually a factual truth, but religion is responsible for a lot. But if you go back through the history of man, there's a lot of heathenistic societies and kingdoms that have killed a ton of people, not just religion, right? But then you got Natalie Portman. She says, I don't believe in the afterlife. I believe this is it. And I believe it's the best way to live. So she believes only in the now, only what she experiences. It's kind of that thing, you know, eat and drink and be merry because tomorrow we perish, right? It's kind of that thought. You got Brad Pitt. He said, I did not understand this idea of God who says, you're to knowledge me, you're to say that I'm the best, and then I'll give you eternal happiness. If you won't, then you don't get it. It seemed to be about ego. I can't see God operating from ego, so it made no sense to me. Now, keep in mind, Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt grew up in Missouri, raised in a Southern Baptist church, got a believing mama. Hello. He's got a mama who's praying for him, if not a grandma who's praying for him. And I, I remember even reading that, you know, Shia LaBeouf and he were in a movie called Fury, a war movie, and Shia LaBeouf's character had quote, all, quoted all these Bible scriptures. So here's Shia LaBeouf and all his crazy, craziness in real life having to quote words of life in this movie. And then on the set, it created a lot of discussion about God, about Jesus, about eternal life. See, they, I don't care what their statements are that the Internet has captured. The truth is they're just people creating the image of God who are seeking for answers and struggling to find it. Here's George Clooney, my look-alike. <laughs> Y'all weren't supposed to laugh. <laughs> Maybe the gray hair only, huh? <laughs> I don't believe in heaven and hell. I don't know if I believe in God. All I know is that as an individual... I won't allow this life, the only thing I know to exist, to be wasted. Again, only operating what he can see. No entrance of faith in believing anything beyond that. And here's a sad one. Even though I don't know personally, or I don't believe personally in the Lord, I try to behave as though he was watching. It's Christopher Reeves. It's a crazy statement. And you know what? I really believe he's saying that because, see, there's an in, innate moral law within all of us. It entered into us through the fall when man ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When we look at the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments that God gave the, the Israelites, that wasn't anything new. There is actually an absolute moral law that's within all humanity. You'd find me somebody who doesn't believe that and let me cheat and steal from them and see if we don't get in a crossways because they feel like they've been treated unfairly. Hello? Otherwise, anything should go. Why would it matter? But we all have an innate moral law within every one of us. And we are created in the image of God. And you see Christopher Reeves wrestling with something inside of him that even though he won't profess and say that he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, yet he has this feeling within him that he's watching. And I really believe what he's wrestling with is he's created in the image of God. Frank Sinatra said, Christ is revered as the Prince of Peace, but more blood has been shed in his name than any other figure in history. You show me one step forward in the name of religion, and I'll show you a hundred retrogressions. George Carlin, bless his heart. He's already passed, but this is what he thought. Religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day of your life, and he has a list of ten things and he does not want you to do. And if you do any of these ten things, he has a special place full of fire and smoke and ash and torture where he will send you to suffer and burn and scream and cry forever and ever until the end of time 
but he loves you. He loves you and he needs money. <laughs> kind of a misconstrued conception of who God is. Totally missing relationship. Doesn't even understand what those Ten Commandments are or why they're in, even in front of us. They're an impasse that we can't get around. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow said, uh, religion is the cause of all the problems in the world. I don't believe in organized religion at all. It's what separates people. One religion has, uh, represents fragments. It causes war. More people have died because of religious conflict than any other re reason. Alan Alda, I was a big MASH fan when I was a kid, says, until I was 20, and that's pretty key. There's a couple of key things he says here. Until I was 20, what do you think that means? Until I went off to college... <laughs> I was sure there was a being who could see everything I did and who didn't like most of it. He seemed to care about minute aspects of my life, like on what day of the week I ate a piece of meat, and yet he let earthquakes and mudslides take out whole communities, apparently ignoring the saints among them who ate their meat on the assigned days. Eventually I realized that I didn't believe there was such a being. It didn't seem reasonable. And again, you see his formation of religion is, is law, is legalism not relationship. He doesn't see it. You see, uh, Billy Joel says, I gradually decided that just because I didn't have or couldn't find the ultimate answer didn't mean I was going to buy the religious fairy tale. As an atheist, you have to rationalize things. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix says, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in an afterlife. I don't believe in soul. I don't believe in anything. I think it's totally right for people to have their own beliefs if it makes them happy. But to me, it's a pretty preposterous idea. It means you can believe what you want to, but if you believe in God, I think it's pretty stupid. That's what, he, that's what he's thinking. Um, Bruce Willis, my man, <laughs> just needs Jesus. It says, organized religion is, in general, in my opinion, or dying forms. They were all very important when... We didn't know why the sun moved, why weather changed, why hurricanes occurred or volcanoes happened. Modern religion is the entrail of modern mythology, but there are people who interpret the Bible literally. So he's kind of astonished that we in this day and age would still interpret the Bible literally, but he believes science is the answer and that what we believe is mythology. And that's not an uncommon thought either. I mean, uh, Don Henley from the Eagles, I love him, love their music, but the truth is he looks at Christianity as a mythology. That's how he, he refers to it, just like it was Greek mythology. Jodie Foster, she says, How could you ask me to believe in God when there's absolutely no evidence that I can see? I do believe in the beauty and the awe-inspiring mystery of the science that's out there that we haven't discovered yet, that there are scientific explanations, phenomena that we call mystical because we don't know any better, which is an interesting commentary for a gal who was in a movie called Contact, if you ever saw that, where uh, she received some signal in space and as they begin to analyze that signal from space, it, it, within it has a blueprint to build this transport device that's going to take them somewhere, some other dimension or some other place in space. And she's the one elected to do it. And when she gets in the thing, the ball just falls to the earth and ends in seconds. But for her, inside that sphere, she was in there for hours. And she has a conversation with her father who had passed away. And he's telling her things about life and what's out beyond. And when she comes out of this thing, this scientist who does everything by reason and by science and by logic now has to explain to the, all these people and governments who've invested billions of dollars into this project what she experienced. And they don't believe her because they saw something fall in seconds. She experienced something in hours and she's having to get them to accept it by faith. Hello. It's kind of what your dilemma is. You're having to speak to people about how you've overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony, <laughs> your experience with Him. Because this is about relationship. I want us to look at a, a video real quick. This is important. You need to see this. You'll see how a lot of our young people are swallowing a lie. David, are you an atheist? Yes. When did you become an atheist? Uh, around age 12. Believing in God makes no sense. It, it's, to, to me, it's the dumbest thing. It's, it's, it's for people that can't accept the fact that they're going to die and rot in the ground like I'm going to do, and, the, and it gives them some relief from, from that thought because it's not the nicest thought in the world. Are you an atheist? Yes. Yes, I am. Yes. 
Yes. Yes, sir. Are you an atheist? I am. Yeah, I'm an atheist. Uh, yes, I am. Alex, do you believe in God's existence? No, I do not. How long have you been an atheist? I would say probably since I was about 15 years old. So you don't believe in the existence of God? No, not really. What happened when you were 15? Um, I started questioning things, and I really just started to think about the logic behind everything. For the most part, we are not shown the evidence for there being a higher power. If we were, I almost guarantee that almost every atheist would immediately agree to there being a higher power. Are you atheists? Yes. Yes. Why? Um, well, I just haven't seen enough uh, evidence, I suppose. I grew up in a Christian family, and just over the few years d during high school and as I grew up, I just realized that there wasn't a lot of evidence to support that belief system. Are you open to evidence? Um, I, I think I am open to evidence. It just would have to be extraordinarily compelling, like out of this world compelling. If you could be given evidence, reasonable evidence, would, it, would you listen to it? Yeah, I would. You're someone who has no faith or no belief in a higher power or a creator, but if you were shown evidence, you would change your mind because you're open. Absolutely. Flick through the pages of the book I just put on your lap, look at the color pictures, and I'll ask you a question. Do you believe that book could happen by accident, that nothing produced the color pictures in the book, that red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet ink fell from the sky and formed itself into those beautiful pictures, and then black ink fell from the sky, or from nowhere, and formed itself into coherent words and sentences, capitals and periods and commas, making sense, page numbers fell from the sky, all in order, and then it bound itself and formed itself into a cover with artwork, and there we have a book. Obviously, intelligent design designed the book. Wouldn't that be correct? Yeah. Can you see where I'm going with this? Yeah. Tell me, what is DNA? What is it? Deoxyribonucleic acid. And it's what makes up our bodies and our cells and everything that makes us who we are. DNA is like our biological code, kind of like binary zeros and ones. Information about us, who we are, what makes us us, parts of us, how we look, um, how we're built, everything like that. Your genes instructed your cells how to make your eyes and what color your eyes should be and your hair and your height and your personality. Scientists call it the instruction book for life. Basically. Everything that you are or ever will be made of starts as a tiny book of instructions found at each and every cell. Every time your body wants to make something, it goes back to the instruction book, looks it up, and puts it together. The book of you would have 46 chapters, one for each chromosome. Each of our book's 46 chapters is between 48 and 250 million letters long. That's 3.2 billion letters total. This is the secret language of DNA. This is the book of life. Instruction book for life. Yes. Instruction book for life. Yes. DNA is made up of genes, and genes give instructions to the cells as to how your body should grow. Did you know that those instructions, the instruction book of your DNA, just your DNA, was laid out end for end, would go to the sun and back a number of times? That book of instructions is so comprehensive. DNA is the genetic information encoded in the cell of every living thing that instructs our cells how to grow and how to function. It's our genes that determine whether our skin will be dark or light, have brown or blue eyes or red or green or yellow, have red hair, be brunette or blonde, be tall or not so tall, or the color of our feathers if we're a bird. Whether we're humans, fish, animals, insects or plant life, the way our bodies look and operate has all been pre-written in the amazing book of our DNA. What do you think the mentality of someone who believes a book fell together without a bookmaker? Uh, well, it would be crazy. Do you think a book could make itself? No, I don't. Of course not. No. Utterly impossible. Yes. <laughs> if anything can happen by accident. I mean, from nothing. Um, wow. Well. Couldn't happen, could it? I don't think so. The impossible. It would be like saying uh, uh, an explosion caused uh, everything that makes a 747 airplane to all just come together by accident without some without some the faith intelligent now. thought behind it. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. Do you believe DNA happened by accident? No, I think that it developed over the course of many, many millennia of evolution and development. DNA exists in every living 
every living thing. Its origins don't matter. The fact that there is intelligent information tells us there must be an intelligent designer. Is this making you think? It is, and I, I do think about it from time to time. It's just, yeah, it's, it's complicated, definitely. Well, it's, DNA's complicated, but the point I'm trying to make is very simple. Book, book designer, or book maker, DNA, intelligent designer. God. Does that make sense? Yes. You're an atheist? I am. What would you think of the mentality of someone who thought a physical book could make itself? Oh, I think they'd be silly. Of course it can't make itself. What would you think of the mentality of someone who believed the instruction book for life, DNA, made itself? Uh, well, I think it'd be silly as well. We would need investigation. That's atheism. Absolutely. And what would you think of the intelligence of someone who believed the instruction book for life made itself? Low, low intelligence level. DNA happened by accident? Um, Probably not too smart. <laughs> DNA couldn't make itself. It's impossible. Does that make sense? Yes. Is this making you think? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what would you think of the person who believed that DNA, the instruction book for life, happened by accident? We're not just talking about human beings, we're talking about every form of life. Fleas, cats, dogs, elephants, cows, horses, trees, plants, everything has DNA. The instruction book for life, which makes the book in your hand just seem feeble compared to the infinite intelligence that must have put the instruction book for life together. Can you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Do you believe DNA happened by accident? Uh, I believe it could. I Explain it to me, how a program could make itself out of nothing on how to make a human eye, giraffe's eyes, elephant's eyes, cats, dogs, puppies, flowers, birds, trees. Every living thing has DNA that's so complex, it's mind-boggling. It must have been a genius beyond any human reasoning that put it together. And to say it happened by chance is infinitely sillier than saying a physical book happened by chance. All I'm doing is reasoning with you. I'm not argue I don't want to win an argument. I'm just saying, I want you to concede something that's absolute common sense. You're an atheist, so you believe the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything. I mean, it can't be nothing. We all have to start from some point. I wouldn't say nothing created it. There had to be something there in the beginning. You like Richard Dawkins, don't you? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I, yeah, I like him. Do you believe nothing created everything, a scientific impossibility, which is what he believes? You don't believe in a creator of all things? If he says that, I think it's a very strange thing to say. Well, he says it. It's insane. Nothing can't create anything because it's nothing. There has to be something in the beginning. Nowhere in our history of, of human reality has something kind of just appeared out of nowhere. Do you believe that nothing created everything? Uh, no, because nothing can't perform actions. That makes no sense. It's a default position. If you say nothing created everything, then you're agreeing with Richard Dawkins. You're mischaracterizing Richard Dawkins because Richard Dawkins, I'm sure he didn't say that. That seems ridiculous. Professor Richard Dawkins, arguably the world's most high-profile atheist, believes that in the beginning there was nothing and that nothing created everything. As he attempts to justify this belief, admitting that it defies common sense, the learned professor calls nothing something. Watch the reaction of his audience. Of course it's counterintuitive that you can get something from nothing. Of course common sense doesn't allow you to get something from nothing. That's why it's interesting. It's got to be interesting in order to give rise to the universe at all. Something pretty mysterious had to give rise to the origin of the universe. But exactly what, what's meant by, by nothing, but whatever it is, it's very, very simple. And <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> Well, I think it's a bit funny to be trying to define nothing. <laughs> Richard Dawkins, I'm sure he didn't say that. That seems ridiculous. The audience reaction confused the normally eloquent professor because he's not used to being the object of laughter. What he didn't realize was he was talking to people who were endowed by their creator with a virtue of common sense. This was just another case where the emperor has no clothes. Someone should tell this man who has deceived millions, you're talking foolishness. Is that what you believe? I mean, it can't be nothing. We all have to start from some point. But there has to be something that created everything. You just, just wasn't God. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It's just, 
evolution, how things became from one organism into many. But that doesn't solve your dilemma of the initial cause. There has to be an initial cause. If there was a big bang in space that from there issued cats and dogs and horses and cows, the sun, the moon, the stars, the seasons, and all this marvel of creation came from a big explosion, what caused the explosion and where do the materials come from from the explosion and why is there such incredible order from the explosion every explosion i've heard of creates chaos not order that makes sense oh yeah this is what you're looking for if you were looking for truth this is your information that you need to say well that's logical how could all this design from the atom to the universe an incredible order just happen by accident because an atheist actually believes nothing created everything which is scientifically impossible and i'm trying to say Haley, i just want you to think you're not just a blob of nothing that it came from an explosion that created order which is against nature that means that you've got purpose and meaning in the universe so it's not altogether bad news i just want a relationship with whoever built me this is too much, too weird that it happened by accident. It didn't happen by accident. I don't feel that. Wow. Way to go, Tim Allen. <laughs> um, it's actually crazy that more faith is required to believe in nothing than something. And then what you find is you kind of break that down. You see quickly, Ray Comfort just got a gift. I ask, I pray for it. I, I pray that I have that ability to talk about things that can be so confrontational, but yet just be calm and peaceful and, and just speak to life. That's what he's doing. That's what we got to learn to do. Because you find that actually their formation of what they believe is very shallow. It's, it's, just, it's just talking points. It's all they have. And um, once you really logically look at it, you find out that every one of them are seekers. And I watched that video the first time and I saw Haley and I saw that sweet, gentle spirit out of her, and I just, my prayer, the moment I saw it, Lord, let fruit come forth from this conversation. Lord, I pray she walks away, and your Holy Spirit haunts her, and I pray that even today, right now, this hour, wherever she's at, that her hands are lifted in worship and praise, and that she's entered into a personal relationship with her Creator. Hello? That's what this is all about today. It's resetting your worldview <laughs> so that you can help reset the worldview of others equipping you just a little bit and stirring your faith and maybe generating some questions for some of our young people. And uh, one site I would encourage you to go to is truelife.org. Josh McDowell endorses it. I went to that site, found it this week, and it's just loaded with resources for topics that are controversial, topics that people will have a lot of discussion about and, and don't, you know, searching for answers. And it's just a good resource for you as moms and dads and, and aunts and uncles and grandparents, you know, and and uh, it, for all of us as believers, just to really have an answer as to what you believe and why you believe it. Amen. And I hope your faith has been stirred this morning. I hope your faith has been stirred. Everybody stand up. See, there is a force of life in the earth. And that force, that, that force that's got everybody stirred up, messed up, is called Jesus. <laughs> And he came into my life and messed everything up for me. And I'm so glad he did. Amen. Because I was making a bigger mess and was on a bad path. And he came and fixed me. He came and put his life in me. He came and it doesn't mean all my problems went away. That's not what happens. But all of a sudden, you know, I can't look at Philippians where I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I can. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter what you're going through. Doesn't matter what the mess looks like around you. But you got the life of Jesus inside of you. Life, the truth, the way. And uh, he will never leave you nor forsake you. He loves you. He's for you. You're created in his image. And that's really the dilemma that those people are wrestling with. And all these quotes that we looked at that they're wrestling with. They're people who have been created in the image of God. And they've not made peace with their creator yet. Amen. And we need to be those people that are able to direct them where they find that peace and that reconciliation with God. For we are all once enemies of God, but we've been reconciled. In that we once were all sinners, but Christ died for us, and he reconciled us. So, Father, I just pray over everyone in this room, Lord God, 
Your word does not return void, Lord God, we know that. Lord, that there would be a reset of our worldview. There would be a reset of our, our faith and our, our uh, uh, intentions. And, Lord, just being intention, intentional and sharing. And, and uh, Lord, having an answer as to why we believe, exploring those things. Because, Lord, it's not only theologically sound what we understand, but it's also the logical answer that there is a creator of all the earth and all living things. So, Father, I pray if there's anyone here today who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that they will not leave this place without settling that issue in their life. And I'm going to ask our prayer teams to come. And as they come, I'm going to ask you, if you just need prayer for anything, if you need to know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have questions regarding that, you'd like somebody to talk to you about it, to pray with you, we would love to do that. Um, if you're here today, you need prayer for healing, you need prayer for breakthrough. If you'd like to join this church, you can come forward and they'll tell you how to do that as well. But, uh, Father, we thank you for this day. And I, th I pray, Father, it was really an important message. I felt that we as a body needed to hear, and particularly for all of our young people in the house to today, and uh, college-age kids, everybody in the house, that, Lord, that we would, we would uh, chip away doubt, chip away uh, fear, chip away timidity, and all these things that hold us back. But really believe what we believe and stand on what we believe. And, Lord, having answers for them. And, Lord, I pray that that was uh, uh, stirred today. And, Lord, that there'd be a deposit of that in each one of us. And, Lord, that we would resolve ourselves to pray, to pray for each other, and to pray for our family members, and pray for our young people and our college kids. It's praying for them, Lord, that you would protect them, and, Lord, that they would be strong in their faith and have a foundation. And it shows us more and more how important it is that we make disciples of one another so that we don't have a wrong view and get to some place like college and have what little foundation we have shattered because we really didn't disciple one another. Lord, that we would be disciples. We'd make disciples of one another and build a foundation upon one another and that, that character in one another. And that we'd know, that we know, that we know, that we know what we believe because we have experienced it through a relationship with you. And that's what you desire for us. So thank you for this day. And Lord, as we leave this place, we give you all praise and glory. And I pray as we leave this place, our eyes and ears will be open to kingdom things and assignments that you have for us. And Lord, we would see what you're doing in the earth and we jump on it and participate with what you're doing, Father. Lord, having eyes where we look at no man according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And Lord God, that we would see what you're doing in the lives of others and speak life to those things that we see going on in the earth. We praise you. We thank you, Father, for who you are, for your grace and for your mercy, for your love and your loving kindnesses. They never fail us, Father. We thank you. And that mercy is new every day. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. So we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you need prayer for anything, please come. Don't leave without letting us pray with you. We've got lots of prayer partners that are still here that uh, are available to pray. Anybody that needs prayer.